The Soviet Union's Vostok space program, which ran from 1960 to 1963, achieved many firsts in spaceflight. After the launch in 1957 of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, the USSR became the first country to send a man, Yuri Gagarin, and a woman, Valentina Tereshkova, into space. They even have credit for launching the first dog. In the summer of 1962, the USSR achieved another notable successful operation with the first joint flight of two separate crewed orbiters, Vostok 3 and 4. This minutely planned mission not only exceeded the flight duration records of all those flights combined, but it also sent a message to the West. The Soviets could launch two rockets at the same time. And they could fly in formation. Breaking records. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union tried to position themselves as world leaders in space technology. The space race, as it was later dubbed by the media, dragged on for just over two decades, between 1955 through 1975. During its first stage, the Soviet Union was considered to be in the lead, in significant part thanks to the research of engineer and mathematician Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. In 1903, Tsiolkovsky posed the rocket equation, which describes the movement of a spacecraft. Immediately after the first successful launch of the artificial satellite Sputnik in 1957, Russia started preparations for crewed missions. Thus began the Vostok space program. History was made on April 12, 1961, when cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space aboard the Vostok space capsule in the Vostok 1 mission. On the Vostok 2 mission, cosmonaut German Titov, the fourth person in space, became the first human to stay in space for more than a day. He orbited the Earth 17 times over the course of 25 hours. For Vostok 3 and 4, the mission became even more demanding. Could the USSR send two spacecraft to orbit at the same time? A simultaneous flight. The development of a simultaneous flight between two spacecraft by the USSR began as far back as 1961, when Soviet engineer Sergei Korolev proposed a three-day spaceflight as a follow-up to the Vostok 2 operation. But the head of cosmonaut training, Nikolai Kamanin, as well as several cosmonauts, were strongly opposed to the idea. There was consensus among them that an extended mission would come with unforeseen health effects. The idea for this three-day flight eventually evolved into a simultaneous flight with two separate spacecraft. When Soviet Union Marshal and politician Dmitry Ustinov, who was in charge of the Soviet rocket industry, heard the possibility of a joint flight, he became thrilled with the idea. Ustinov delivered a written proposal to Nikita Sergeyevich himself, who was also enthusiastic about the possibility of breaking yet another record. According to reports, the main reason Sergeyevich gave the go-ahead to the mission was that it would be, quote, another proof for the entire world that the Americans were hopelessly behind the USSR. It was settled. Vostok 3 would last nearly four days, while Vostok 4 would be launched a day later. The close orbits of Vostok 3 and 4 would keep the number of variables to a minimum, which would allow the measurement of individual differences in adaptation to spaceflight. Several modifications were implemented to the Vostok capsule to increase data collection volume on the mission's conditions. This information would be useful for future flights. To achieve radio communication between the two spacecraft, radio electronics expert Boris Chertok was ordered to build a communication system with the capability to monitor the transmission from the ground. Yuri Bikov, the leading specialist in Vostok radio systems at a radio communications research institute, was also contacted for the research. Chertok and his associates started intensive training involving radio engineers, antenna specialists, and communications personnel at military unit number 32103. The lucky cosmonauts selected for the mission were Andrian Nikolev and Pavel Popovich. They were chosen out of all the other cosmonauts because they were the least likely to get space sick. Another objective of this simultaneous flight was to study the reactions of the two men under similar circumstances. To minimize health side effects, the cosmonauts were explicitly trained to combat space sickness. Apart from the required training, they were tutored by German Titov, the cosmonaut from the Vostok 2 mission, and thoroughly rehearsed their spacecraft maneuvers and the other planned activities in a simulator. The Vostok 3 and 4 flights were initially programmed for November 1961, a great PR strategy for the Soviet program, as they would have been launched in the same year as the first two Vostok missions. The USSR would have launched four men into space, while the United States would have sent zero. But these plans were thwarted by the Zenit photo reconnaissance satellite program that needed some of the same equipment. Technical problems plagued the Zenit program and pushed the simultaneous mission even more towards the spring of 1962. Then it was pushed once again towards the middle of May of that year, and then all the way to the summer. The mission. Finally, 
After several setbacks, on August 11th, 1962, cosmonauts Nikolev and Bikovsky left their sleeping quarters. They traveled to the assembly building to suit up for their mission. Afterward, a bus transported them to the launch pad, and Nikolev climbed into the Vostok 3 spacecraft. At 11.30 a.m., Vostok 3 launched, and the spacecraft safely separated from its upper platform in a safe orbit 12 minutes later. When Nikolev adjusted his spacecraft's orientation to watch the upper platform detach, he couldn't see anything. However, he later reported that while flying over Turkey, he could see the cities from above and distinguish airport runways, ships, and roads. On his first day in orbit, Nikolev helped the USSR break another record by unstrapping himself from his seat and becoming the first person to float in microgravity. Since all his training had been planned to avoid space sickness, he moved carefully and slowly at first. After he got comfortable with his unusual situation, he could use his radio and film his experience with a camera. Nikolev eventually floated three more times during his record-breaking mission. At 11.08 a.m. the next day, cosmonaut Popovich was launched aboard Vostok 4. Both vehicles were launched from the same launch pad within 0.5 seconds from the scheduled time, a tremendous achievement in space logistics. This time, Nikolev was able to catch a surreal view as he watched the Vostok 4 capsule enter an orbit near him. During Vostok 3's fourth orbit, Nikolev attempted to contact the control tower, but according to him, there was a deafening noise in the radio system, which made it inaudible. This issue was resolved later, and both cosmonauts communicated effectively with the control tower. Nikolev and Popovich were able to communicate with each other via the shortwave radio system set up by the engineers soon after approaching each other in orbit. They continued to have spacecraft-to-spacecraft -spacecraft conversations with each other over the remaining course of their mission. The two spacecraft came as close as three miles from each other. Still, without proper maneuvering capabilities, Vostok 3 and 4 drifted apart relatively quickly. During the mission, Soviet space officials, including Yuri Gagarin himself, monitored the simultaneous flight from a building in Turatim. When Vostok 3 completed 29 orbits, data showed that the craft's temperature fell from 80 degrees Fahrenheit at launch hour to 55 degrees and remained at this level until orbit 36. Nikolev later explained that he intentionally kept the heating system down as he liked his sleeping quarters cold. The Tests During their mission, Nikolev and Popovich were instructed to conduct a series of tests to determine their ability to maneuver and work under microgravity conditions. While the tests were being conducted, the control tower monitored their vital statistics. Their behavior and movements were observed through a camera. Their speech and sleep patterns were also monitored. Nikolev reported that he slept relatively well, but always woke up a few hours before his scheduled sleeping period. The test's results showed that humans could work correctly over a long time in microgravity situations. This evidence was useful in posterior missions. Rocky Landing After four days in orbit, cosmonaut Nikolev landed successfully north of Lake Balkash in Kazakhstan. His landing site was scattered with rocks and dirt, but he could land on a clean patch of ground. Six minutes later, Cosmonaut Popovich landed 190 miles away. A search plane was able to locate him in 20 minutes. Although official flight reports from Vostok 4 indicated a successful landing, many years later, Popovich revealed a different story in an interview. He reported that strong winds caught him off guard after ejecting from the spacecraft and as he was beginning his parachute descent, barely escaping a fatal injury. He attempted to warn the doctors about to jump out from the rescue plane, but his effort was futile. Several doctors were shaken mercilessly by the strong winds. Some even ended up with a bloody face from falling on them. A Celebration The Vostok 3 mission lasted 94 hours, while Vostok 4 did 71 hours of flight. After the successful re-entry, the top Soviet engineers celebrated with the rest of the USSR for three days. Still, they were required to return to their office to prepare for another Vostok operation. The Vostok's last flights consisted of another double operation. Vostok 5 launched on June 14, 1963, and Vostok 6 on June 16th. The two spacecraft again passed within three miles of each other and were able to establish radio communication. Vostok 5's cosmonaut Valery Bukovsky's five-day flight remains the longest solo spaceflight in Earth orbit as of 2020. Vostok 6, however, established another remarkable record as it carried the first woman into space, Valentina Tereshkova. The Vostok program was cancelled and eventually replaced by the Soyuz program, which is still active today. <laughs>